Hola. I could not wait to do that. I had been watching those blocks go up and down for two days, and I just couldn't wait to walk out of one of them. So <laughs> I'm so happy to be here. Um, I'm going to take you on a journey. And what I have found in everything that I have lived through is that most often in life, we do not choose our journeys, but our journeys choose us. And to help explain that, I'm going to tell you a story. Now, my story takes place in 1984 in the state of North Carolina, in a small town called Burlington, North Carolina. I was a 22-year-old college student, and like most 22-year-olds, I had all kinds of dreams. I had goals, I had ambitions, and everything was lined up just perfect for my life. I was making straight A's. I was to graduate top of my class, summa cum laude. I was going to walk in the front. I was dating the right guy, for the first time ever, and I was going to get married. I worked two jobs at this time so that I could afford an independent lifestyle, so that I could have my own apartment, live by myself. Now, July 28th started out like any other day, but sometime around 3 o'clock in the morning of July 29th, my life became a train wreck. See, I'd gone to bed that night, and around 3 o'clock in the morning, I was awakened. I was awakened with a knife to my throat. A man had broken into my apartment. He had robbed me. And the next thing I knew, I was fighting for my life. Now, something became very clear to me in those moments. One was, I was probably going to die. Things went through my mind very quickly. One was, I was never going to see my mother and my father again. That this was it for me. This was the last image that my eyes were going to see. This was the last thing that my body was going to feel. And then I wondered, when I died, would it hurt? Would I die slowly? Would I die quickly? How would I die? Would he stab me? Would he beat me? I just didn't know, but I knew that I was in danger. Over the next 20 minutes, as he raped me and assaulted me and did unspeakable things to me, I made a decision, a decision that would save my life. One is that I would not die in that bed. He would not kill me there. And that when I lived, I would know what you look like. I was able to escape that night. I ran for my life. I ended up at a college professor's home who let me in. And the next thing I knew, I was taken to the hospital. It would be at the hospital that I would learn he had left my apartment and raped another woman within an hour after my assault. My body now was the crime scene. The evidence had to be collected. It had to be plucked and probed and swabbed. And all I knew was that I wish they could have unzipped my skin and dropped it in a bag because I was no longer Jennifer. I could recognize myself in the mirror. I could look in the mirror and I could say, yeah, that's her. But what made me me, who made Jennifer unique and special and wonderful, he had killed it. He had destroyed my soul. He had destroyed my spirit. And I hated him. I hated him with a rage that I could feel in the bottom of my stomach coming up into the back of my throat. I wanted him to die. I helped the police to do a composite sketch. I looked through a photographic lineup and I picked him out. I looked through a physical lineup and I found him again. His name would be Ronald Cotton. Ronald Cotton would stand trial in January of 1985. Two weeks of my life, I would hear lie after lie after lie. And I not only hated Ronald Cotton, you see, I hated everyone who loved Ronald Cotton. Two days of my life, I had to testify and describe every horrible thing he did to me in front of my mother, my father, my friends, the jury, the judge. The jury deliberated four hours, 
and they found Ronald Cotton guilty. Guilty of first-degree rape, first-degree sexual offense, first-degree breaking and entering. Ronald Cotton would receive life in 54 years. And we would have champagne and we would toast. The judicial system worked for me, the victim. He would spend the rest of his life in prison, which is where animals deserve to go. And then I would go back to the district attorney's office, and they would pat me on the back, and they would say, now you can move on. You can put your life back together again, Jennifer. But how do you do that? I didn't have a life to put back together again. Everything that I had planned on was gone. I hated this man. The years would roll by. I would fall in love. I would get married in 1988. I would get pregnant in 1989. In the spring of 1990, I would give birth to triplets, two girls and a boy. Morgan, Blake, and Brittany, my gifts from God, because I was a good person, I was valuable, I was worthy. He trusted me to raise these incredible children. Those years flew by until the spring of 1995, when a DNA test would be asked to be run. I didn't think about it, because you see, for 11 years, I had seen Ronald Cotton's face in my nightmares every night of my life. I would pray to God, please, God, tonight, let him die. Let him die in prison, but before he leaves this earth on the way to hell, let him know what that was like for me, that fear, that pain, how I suffered. I wanted him to know that before he died. The DNA test was run. They came to my house in June of 1985, and they stood in my kitchen. They said, Jennifer, the results are back in. You see, the problem is it wasn't Ronald Cotton who raped you. It was a man by the name of Bobby Poole. I had been wrong. I had been so sure. I was so wrong. I had, I had calculated. I had determined that this was right. I was certain. I was as certain as... I wasn't Morgan, Blake, and Brittany were my children. What was I supposed to do? What was I supposed to say? Right? Do you say you're sorry? Do you say, gee, I'm really, really, really sorry about those 11 years, Ronald. I couldn't move. I couldn't function. It would take another two years before I would ask to see this man, Ronald Cotton. I sat in a pastor study not far from where I had been raped, April of 1997. I waited for this moment, unsure of what I was going to say, unsure of what he was going to say, and before I knew it, this beautiful six-foot-four African-American man stood in the doorway, and I could not move. I started to cry. I said to him, Ronald, if I spent every second of every minute of every hour of every day telling you how sorry I am, for what I did to you, could you ever forgive me? And of all the scenarios I had come up with, the one I didn't, didn't think about was Ronald taking my hands and crying and saying to me, Jennifer, I'm not angry at you. I forgive you. I forgave you years ago. I don't want you to be afraid of me. Don't look over your shoulders thinking I will hurt you because I won't be there. You see, what Ronald Cotton did that day was he released me. He gave me my life back. He showed me that love and hate can't coexist in the same human heart, that you can't be a loving person and be a hateful person. You can't be a person that's peaceful and be a person who is angry. Ronald Cotton, the man that I would pray to die, would be the man who would teach me how to live again. I would like for you all to um, put your hands together and please welcome my dearest friend, my treasure, my blessing, Ronald Cotton.
Thank you. Um, it was back in August 1984. Uh, I was being wanted from the police department for a crime I did not commit. I voluntarily go down to the police department and try to prove my innocence, but instead they locked me up for a crime I did not commit. I placed in the county jail on a $150,000 bail. I went to trial, I was tried and convicted. But before I was sentenced, I asked the judge to give me his permission to sing a song. And that song went something like this. I would try to sing that song, but uh, it would be kind of difficult, but I'm going to try it anyway because I had a stroke back in July, and uh, it's hard for me to pronounce my words correctly. But it went something like this. It said, decisions I can no longer make cause my future so unknown to me and that I can no longer take Cause during the day I wonder And I'd hurt with fear Call out your name so much And suddenly tears appear Until God came in my life Until God came in my life I was often alone and people I really couldn't face. I just didn't know what to do, but forgot to feel so out of place. And if only you could see me, then you would know how I feel. I'm not the same person I used to be. Sometimes I don't think that it's real. How I many times must I say this before you agree? There's no other God who could ever love you. Not quite as much as Lord God. Believe me, everyone, my God will love you. And that is a fact. Because I would pray both night and day until God came into my life. And so, after that song, <laughs> the judge handed me down a prison term of life and 54 years. I went into prison not knowing what the future held for me, but I met this guy that had committed this crime that I was serving time for. I made me a homemade weapon. I wanted to take this guy life. But my father came to visit me one day. I told him my intentions, and he told me, he said, Ron, do not kill this man in prison. He said, because you tell me that you're innocent. If you kill this man, then just why you'll spend the rest of your life at. So it, it was hard for me to swallow. I went back to my dormitory. I laid down on my bed with my weapon on my chest, and I looked at this guy. He slept in the same dormitory with I, and I told him, I said, when I get the opportunity, that you're mine. And by that, I told him I would take him out, but I didn't want to take him out to lunch. So as time went by, I was in five different prisons. I learned about the OJ case because they were transferring me through the system. And I was in this dormitory in Mason, Tennessee, and I saw this OJ case on television. And I said, well, they're talking about the DNA. I'm going to write you to the courts of appeal so can I get this done in my case. And so therefore, I sat down late one night and wrote me a letter to the courts of appeal expressing my situation. The courts of appeal wrote me back, instructed me that they would be willing to do this test. But if it came back stating different, this is why I would spend the rest of my life. I told them, therefore, to go ahead and put their foot down and go with it that I did not have anything to lose for I have not committed such a crime. So they put the foot down. It took about 90 days before this test came back, and the test came back good. The warden of that prison called me in his office that night and said, Cotton, you're going home tomorrow. The crime you was in prison for, the guy, Bobby Poole, confessed to it. So you're a free man. So the very next day, I went back to the court, and they dismissed all the charges. Me and my family, we stood up and cheered for joy because that's what it was all about. 
And after getting back out in society, I had the opportunity to meet Miss Thompson. I met her in a local church in Elon College, North Carolina. I did not know what I was going to say to her because it was just one of those situations where you would not know. But after meeting her, I saw her sitting down in a little jean dress outfit, an innocent young lady. I then I looked and told her that I'm sorry for what happened to her, but she chose the wrong individual. But in the process, I do not want her to go through life thinking that I'm going to be the one to harm her or her family, that all I want from her was peace and happiness. And I wanted to be peaceful and happy in the process. Therefore, you know, we stood up and hugged each other, and we cried, and we shared a lot of tears together. My wife, she was there. You know, I got married since I've been out, uh, and I have a daughter, she's 13 years old, named Raven. And so now that we are living in maybe North Carolina, and we've just been happily ever after. And now that me and Jennifer, we go out and do this, speaking to people like you that are willing to listen and make a change in the judicial system. And so by coming together, those ones that try to change the law and want to change the law, you can do this by staying in touch with one another. And that is my story. Thank you.